Are you working on your author career but struggling to get that first book published? Does the goal of being an author seem too lofty? Or thoughts of having multiple books and making a full-time living are as fantastical as living in Cinderella's castle? Welcome to Discovered Wordsmiths, a podcast where aspiring authors can be heard. Join Steven Schneider as he finds and talks to authors you may not know, but authors that have gotten their foot on the author career path. Hear what they've done to get there and where they want to go now. Settle back. It's time for a bit of inspiration and advice. Come listen to today's Discovered Wordsmith. All right. (laughs) A little technical difficulties. Yeah, just a little technical difficulties. That's right. It's all good. All right. Well, Ron, uh, thank you. I appreciate you taking the time coming on this to talk to me a little bit. Uh, It's great to see you. We've been friends for a couple years now. So, Oh, yeah. We've been friends for probably, I, I, I bet you it's going on about four years now. Yeah. I mean, Colin is almost 20, so. That's that's right. That's right. So I think that, oh, yeah, he may have been 15 years old. So, yeah, yeah. he's probably been a little bit longer. Yeah. But I've been excited ever since you asked me to come on. I've been, I actually was very flattered. And I'm sorry about those little minor technical uh, issues. I think we'll be yeah, we'll be fine now. No, no big deal. All right, well, let's just jump right into it. So, I, I appreciate it. Um, first of all, let, tell us a little bit about you outside of writing. Who you are? All right. Um, well, I mean, I, I think it's the same way with you. And I think the, one of the reasons why we hit it off so well is that we're both dads who are basically <laughs> with our families, right? I mean, that is the thing. I think that the overall thing about who I am. Uh, anymore as a father and now just a month ago today a grandfather so that impacts and shapes you who you are you know um but you know i'm uh i work with families i've worked with families for most of my adult life uh i've been working with uh young kids and i've also been working with uh, uh the senior population as well so i've always had a form of counseling in my background uh that i've been doing like i said for most of my adult life I like the outdoors. I like to read. I like to write. I like um, I like Chinese food. I like Italian food. I like long strolls on the beach. You know, all that good stuff. So, you like yogurt? That old I do. I do. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yogurt with a little bit of granola in it. My daughters are the ones that got me onto that. Uh, yeah, I agree. That's, that's pretty yeah. good. Okay, so a li- I, I know a little bit about your background and what you do. You're an interesting writer in that you don't focus on nonfiction or fiction. You kind of do both. And it kind of ties into a lot of your uh, daytime work and some of your extracurricular work. So I know that's kind of a whole big thing. Um, t- tell us a little bit about how you got into it and what I'm talking about, because I'm kind of beating oh, around yeah. the bush. Well, I'll tell you, um, whenever I went, to the, I, I, I went to the University of Pittsburgh, uh, and I, I waited two years before I went into college. So it was like one of those things where I didn't really know what I was going to do. My dad had his own construction business. I was able to work there. I was made, able to make, you know, a, you know, a comfortable living. In Western Pennsylvania, that's usually what happens. Um, I graduated from high school in 1987. Um, most everybody went on to some sort of higher education. But if you can believe it, people around here were like, getting degrees in mine safety maintenance. Like it was that kind of stuff. Nobody was going for any kind of liberal arts type of thing. So I really didn't know what I was going to do. I, nobody in my college and my, my family had been, had been to college before. So I really didn't know what I was going to do. And I remember I, I got off of work with my dad one night and um, over at our movie theater, they were playing Kenneth Branagh as Henry V. And I thought, you know, I heard some good things. I, I watch it. And I was really kind of amazed that there were things out there because I was living kind of like a hobbit. You know, I didn't know what was <laughs> on the horizon. So whenever I said, I, I said, you know, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to expand my horizons a little bit. So I went to the University of Pittsburgh and I majored in English and I read all these great books. And I decided very early on that I wanted to write. I wanted to leave some sort of impact. Um, on the world whenever I left it. You know, I had all these dreams. I was 21 years old. I had all these great notions and everything. So um, I thought I would get into poetry. So I took a lot of fiction writing in order to improve my poetry because I wanted to be cinematic. I wanted to be very visual whenever people read. Um, And I, I, you know, went through school. I went to graduate school where I majored in history. 
And then as life happens, um, I ended up meeting somebody and very quickly she became pregnant and then we had a family. So all of my hopes and dreams were now kind of put on the back burner a little bit and I had to go out and get a real job. <laughs> you know, at this time I'm like 30 years old. I was very um, uh, kind of happy living with my mom. You know what I mean? I, I was going to school uh, during the day and I was having a part-time job at night. I was great. This was awesome. And then I had to become an adult. And it, it was years. I mean, it was probably about four or five years before I decided that, look, I have stories in me to tell and I want to write something, you know? So I started off and I wrote a novel, you know, one of these kind of like uh, – uh, a horror novel type of thing because I thought, you know, that would that's going to get me some sort of recognition. Um, and I went through, um, I guess it was uh, Create Space back in the day, you know, yeah, yeah. Create Space. Um, and I remember, you know, it didn't sell anything. And then, but one of my interests and in what comes into play with, with you and I and uh, Colin is that, you know, I also had an interest in the paranormal as well, too. Um, because I grew up in Pennsylvania. There's a lot of cases of UFOs and Bigfoot and things like this around my area. So I started to delve into a lot of the folklore. Um, and I wrote a book called The Unexplained World of the Chestnut Ridge. It got some notoriety. It got me on coast to coast. And that really was kind of what drew me into the field. Um, I, I do like to write. Uh, but re writing research books is very um, cumbersome and tiresome. And you have to go through so much. Um, I would much rather write fiction, and I write a lot of poetry as well, too. Um, I probably, by the end of July, I will have, I think, my fifth collection of poetry out. So I'm very prolific whenever it comes to poetry. And at the end of the day, if I would be known for anything, it would I would like to be known as a poet. But that doesn't pay a lot of bills. You know, actually, nowadays, as, as you probably know as well, too, with the idea of brick and mortar stores going under and people turning to so much electronic media, it's very difficult now to be an author. Um, but it's something that drives me um, and it's something that I still keep at it, you know? So I went into the world of paranormal writing uh, simply because it was, well, of course it was a passion for mine, of, of mine, but it was also allowing me to have an income coming in as well too. Whereas the poetry side really would do that. But now that I'm getting a little bit more recognition, I can start putting my poetry out there. More people are buying it because they've bought my other books as well. Wow, that's, that's actually great. I didn't know about much of the poetry. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me back up because I do know about the nonfiction. So that's interesting, I think, for most people. And I know uh, I'm, I'm going to lead some of these questions for you. So you've written several nonfiction books now on paranormal, yeah. ghosts, uh, those types of things, folklore, big on folklore, which is sure. – and um, I know you don't sell these at, through normal channels, trying to get into bookstores, and you do sell them online, but that's not where you always sell them. You, you do a lot of talking and go to conventions and stuff, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Now, two of my books, I will tell you, um, went through traditional publishers, okay? Uh, I remember I was so excited whenever I got my first contract through the mail. I mean, I was, I, was, I was jumping up and down. This is like everybody's goal whenever you're in college and you want to be a writer, that somebody says, I'm going to accept your thing. Uh, the first contract that I got, they took 96% royalties. 90. And you have to make a certain amount of money before you would get any of that money. You know what I mean? So I've seen zero... Uh, revenue from any from that book whatsoever um and then the other book that I, I i had written as well too the intellectual property now has been returned to me so i am able to now publish it on my own but whenever everybody's goal was always going to, to traditional publishers that was my holy grail that's something that i wanted but unless you are one of these people with you know the name recognition or unless you have a network you're not going to be getting an advancement. That's not going to happen. You're not going to be able to get that display at Barnes and Noble. You're not going to be able to get that 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 tour as uh, you know a book tour as you know a, a talking about your book. That stuff's not going to happen. So I always steer people in the direction of independent publishing because that intellectual property is now yours. Um, you have control of it, and you're going to see a lot more money. Um, 
the traditional publisher that I went through, if I were going to buy a book off of them, they wanted twelve dollars per book, and they were expecting you to sell the book for twenty four dollars. So you would make about a fifty percent profit. Now, if you would go into um, the self publishing, you're going to be able to buy a book for two or three dollars. You know, so that's the way I always steer people, especially if they're very unclear about what they want to do in their life. This is going to be their career, or whatever, um, because going through traditional publishers, you're going to get your heart broken. You're going to be put down a lot of times. Sometimes it's just personal taste. And sometimes you're rejected because they don't know who you are. Some places want you to uh, submit through an agent, you know? So I go through all these stumbling blocks to finally get to the point where I can control my own destiny. I can control about what I put out, when I put out, I have creative control over the, uh, the uh, whatever appears in my book. And the another important thing too, is if you ever get to the point where your books are being used for television, I'm not, I'm talking about even to appear on there as a talking head. Um, a lot of the times the publishers own the rights to you doing that as well too. Um, so it's very, it's very good whenever you're starting out to keep all of your, uh, all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak. You control what you do. If, if it gets to the point wherever you are, you know, you, you rise, you explode, whatever, then you can start thinking about this stuff. But uh, to get to get started, look, I'm 51 years old, and I still would prefer to be independently published rather than a publishing house. And uh, one of the things you do with that is I know you go to – various conventions, fairs, oh, festivals, yeah. and right. you have a table and you sell right from there. That's right. That was the other part two of that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So it requires, it's, it's almost like politics. There's a lot of, um, uh, you know, shaking hands and uh, not so much baby kissing, but there's a lot of, <laughs> shaking hands, there's, a lot of there's a lot of talking because you have to sell yourself. So whenever I go to a conference, um, sometimes you get paid very little for appearing, but most of the times, you're paying to be there, you know, right. understand that, you know, you're paying for your own table, you're paying for your place to stay gas and everything. So whenever you go there, you're already starting in the hole by several hundred dollars. Now, what I do as an author is now I have to get my point across, I have to basically sell myself. And then I hope to recoup the, any of the money that I lost on book sales. And that really is a big thing. And I'm talking about going to places like I read about the paranormal. So I'll do a lot of paranormal festivals. I'll do a lot of ghost shows or UFO shows or cryptid cons and things like that. But it's also going to arts fairs. It's also going to little local community fairs. It's going to any place that has a prospective audience that might buy my book. So do you, do you think um, you would sell uh, as many books if it was just traditional, leaving it out to them and not doing the festivals, or do you think you sell more because you you're known, you're you're talking? Doing oh yeah, festivals? yeah. See, yeah. The, the, if I sell without any kind of publicity or anything like that, if I would just allow the powers that be, people search <laughs> on you know Amazon, if I would sell five books per month, that would be a lot of books. In all honesty, I mean because. If you're just allowing people to go to searches and look up Bigfoot or book, look up, you know, Lake Monsters, whatever, that's usually what it comes out to be, about five books a month, somewhere around there. So, and that's not going to even pay my electric bill, you know. So it really requires me to be out there among people. And also the other thing is too, we talked about this on other occasions, just because you're an author and people like you doesn't necessarily mean people want to buy anything off of you. A lot of people don't like to read nowadays. So people are going into different things like, you know, not only the, elect the electronic publishing so you can get everything down on you know, your iPhone or whatever. People are going into a lot of audio things as well, too. So it's, and, and I'm very computer illiterate as we can see at the start of the show. <laughs> so at the end of the day, I'm relying on so many other people to get my product out there that unless I re re relied on those people, it wouldn't be out there. So I, I'm very good at, at communication, but I'm very poor at self-promotion. That's just something that I've never been trained on. I guess that was my, you know, Irish Catholic background. You know, you, you don't have to have some sort of humility. Um, so whenever I go out there, I am I'm selling myself as a product uh, that, look, I am a fan as much as you are. I still watch the shows. Whenever I go to any of these programs and I see something that I see on TV, I'm still like a fanboy. I still want to get their autograph and everything. 
but I want to make a product that they are going to enjoy as much as I enjoy. Because writing, you know this, very time consuming, especially if you write something that's research based. Um, you have to, you know, cite sources and you have to, you, you have to go deeper than if you're just simply writing uh, a fantasy off the top of your head. Um, and there's legal issues with that as well, too, to use other people's, you know, quotes and everything. So it's time consuming. And I am not going to write a book that I myself would not enjoy reading. Well, that I think is important because I think a lot of times we hear authors, oh, this is big and hot. I'm going to write for that. And yep. they do, but it's nothing they write well, so they don't, they're not successful. That's ex exactly right. Exactly. exactly. So, so a little something. Uh, besides the writing, I know that you've gotten some acting jobs and a um, uh, personal little story. Uh, last Christmas, I flipped on the Travel Channel and – I practically got whiplash. I said, I know that guy. That's Ron yeah. Murphy. He's on TV yeah. with Freddy Krueger. So tell us about <laughs> right. that. How'd that happen? Well, I was doing a very little festival in Littleton, North Carolina. And I was there with Ken Gearhard. This was the first year for whatever. And it was like, you know, they had a good turnout. They probably had, you know, a little over 100 people. Uh, but the town is very, very small. We're talking about a town of several thousand people. So we had like 10% of the town there. Um, so um, I didn't think much of it. And then a couple of weeks later, I got a call and I said, uh, would you be interested in um, auditioning for a show on the Travel Channel? I said, yeah, how did you find out about me? And they said, we had people at Littleton that saw you. So keep that in mind as well, too. Even these little festivals can get you recognized. So um, I, uh, I I did the audition. Did you ask them if they uh, bought one of your books while they were there? I, no, I did not. You know what? I assume <laughs> that they did not. They did True. not, I assume. So, so anyway, um, I'm sorry. So I, I tried out for Go, and um, they had me sit down at my, uh, my, my table, and then I had to wear, like, a leather jacket, and I had to wear my hat because I had to look the part, mind you. So I auditioned for that, uh, and then the response came back, that the Travel Channel likes you, you have to keep the hat, you have to keep the jacket, all that stuff. Um, they flew me out to California, I think it was in July, and it was about 105 degrees, and I had to wear the hat, and I had to wear the leather <laughs> coat, and everything. And um, we, we did the entire season, flew back, um, and about a week later, I get a call, and they said, um, the, um, the powers that be at the Travel Channel changed over. Uh, they think you look too much like Josh Gates. We have to bring you back and film the thing over again so yeah <laughs> so i had to fly back out there working 12 hour days you know I, and that's the other thing too i've been out to california twice i've seen nothing i've seen the hollywood sign from the distance i, I saw the ocean from the distance they didn't supply us with a car they didn't supply us with anything so like i really don't know what's going on behind beside the heat and what a studio looks like <laughs> but it was interesting it was a great it was a great uh, um show um but it's interesting because you said it was over Christmas. Um, it was on Christmas Day. They gave a little sneak peek of this. Right. Um, and then they decided to air it uh, the day before my birthday. March 19th was going to be the air date. Uh, wouldn't you know it, that is the same week of a pandemic. <laughs> right. <laughs> Watching CNN to find out how many people were dying. And the show was canceled. Oh. Yes, yeah, the show was canceled. So uh, now um, I'm you know, still in, in talks with other people. Uh, but um, in the meantime... To anybody that's listening from Canada, you have a great show in Canada out of Vancouver called Red Earth Uncovered. Um, it's very difficult to get in the United States. There are segments of the, of, of the United States geographically that you can get this because it's put out by the Native American uh, or the First Nations Network. Um, it is one of the best shows on the paranormal that I've ever been involved with. It's only a half an hour show. They do great work. Um, but it's one of these shows where I think it really should be more, I mean, they should try to sell it to the United States. Uh, but I, I did um, two years for that. I'm appearing in this year, and then I'll appear in next year as well, too. But um, that's Red Earth Uncovered on the APTN network. Um, but, yeah, so those are my two little things. And that's what, got, that's what got me through, you know, writing and doing conferences. People just heard me, and uh, they said, hey, we'd like to give this guy a shot. That's that's pretty cool. Are you now? It I know is. for for a while you stepped back from doing the talks and you were just doing oh, yeah. writing. And I think 
uh, in that time, you've come out with a fiction story and some more poetry. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, it, it, it's kind of cool uh, because I started out fiction writing. Um, I started out writing a, that, the novel, The Pack. I started out uh, writing um, a, a collection of short stories that I had previously published called The Tormented Ten Tells of Terror. Um, and then um, really the poetry. I mean, because, you know, in college, that, that's what I wanted to be. So I had this wealth of, of poetry that I decided I would put together. And my first collection came out called um, um, Gypsy Heart. Um, so that was my first collection. And then um, as I was going through my divorce, I came out with a collection called Northern Star. And then um, uh, my, uh, my, my, my fiance now and I, we put out a collection called uh, Melancholia. Um, together, um, and we're we're just finishing up with another collection called Breaking Through. Uh, but I have Ars Erotica coming out. Well, it's already out, as a matter of fact. And a lot of people kind of, hey, Ars Erotica. What is this? Some sort of no. It, it just goes with the name. It's a take on Aristotle's Ars Poetica. So it's called Ars Erotica. So the, the, the looking for love and things like that. Um, and then I will have uh, another uh, uh, book coming out too called uh, rust and dust and that should be released probably in the next month as well too so these are all poetry collections that i'm putting out and now in the united states um on vampires thanks to your help will be now be available very soon and then my other book on witches which will be my other paranormal book so i'll have two new books on the paranormal coming out and uh so next time i see everybody about two new books on the paranormal and probably about four or five new books of poetry collections will be coming out. Wow, that's great. And and it switched over from someone else controlling it to you're controlling it. And it sounds like yes. you're going in multiple directions. I know you're leading a ghost hunt in July. Maybe. Is that that's still right. going on? At, at Hillview Manor, yeah. Well, you know, that's the other thing, too. It was, it was supposed to be 100 people. Now we can't have any more than 25 people. Um, it's going to be an intimate setting. Um, but, you know, that's the thing. I mean, everything is changing. I have lost thousands of dollars already this year because all these festivals are being canceled. You, I don't know if you heard, but Mothman was just canceled. Did you hear that? Really? Oh, man. Yeah, the Mothman Festival was canceled. So locally, like the Kecksburg Festival, which is about eight miles away from my door, that was canceled. And that is yeah. you know, the amount of revenue that I, that I was drawing from. And the Arts and Heritage Festival over here in Westmoreland County in Pennsylvania um, that gets about um, about half a million people a year, and that was canceled as well, too. Man. So all these outlets are now no longer um, open to us. Um, and that's what a lot of people have to understand as well, too. I mean, we have um, the what we're dependent upon, um, you know, going out there and meeting people and doing presentations. All that kind of stuff is now gone. So we're, we're kind of recollecting ourselves. Thank the good Lord that I have a job. Um, I work with the with the school district so i'm off paid from um the uh first week of uh june to the first week of uh, august so i have time and everything but all that time that i would be able to help with my kids because of course being irish catholic i've got five kids and a grandkid you know how it goes <laughs> and so well too plus i have two stepkids as well in the house so yeah it's 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 one of those things where uh the idea of publish or perish Kind of takes a whole new meeting whenever uh, you know if you're not making money off of this stuff. So yeah, I was supposed to have an author table at the local uh, Harry Potter Wizard World Festival, but that yeah. was canceled. And I was supposed yeah, to be on see, an author roundtable, and that was canceled. So yes, yes. And and the thing is, though, Stephen, see that that is the thing that really gets your name out there. Look, you appear at these little things like I did. You appear at these little places, and they say, "Hey, I know that guy," or you know, "I read his stuff," or even better, you should read his stuff because I read that stuff, okay? It's all going to be this local stuff. And then it starts building up because people will tell people, you know. But unless we have these functions to attend, we're never going to be get our, getting our name out. I mean, these things help. But, uh, help. These podcasts help, uh, radio shows and all that kind of stuff. But unless you can really meet somebody and talk to them and question them and see where they're coming from, it's really difficult as an author in America today. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I'm doing this podcast. Um, instead of interviewing people who have, quote unquote, made it big, have 100 books out, make 200,000 a year or whatever, I want yeah. to talk to other authors that are 
working on it, still struggling, trying to make it as more of an inspiration. Look, I, I've done a little bit. So those of us that are still working on it can say, look, I can get that far. I can do a little bit. They've done it. And That's maybe right. help each other, uh, you know, these well, things. It, well, it, it all comes out of networking. And, and, and the points that you're making are very pertinent. So I don't care if you're in high school listening to this or you think you're a seasoned author, you know, and, 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 and you know, you're, you're in your 60s or what have you. But these are all very pertinent points. The only way to make it in any entertainment industry is through networking. That's the only way to do it, okay? I can have the best idea in the world, but unless I know somebody to take that idea to, nobody gives a damn about what I have, you know? I, there's a local person in, in our town um, who uh, I, I don't know, but uh, her uh, book made it on the Oprah Winfrey Book of the Month Club. Okay. It's a very good book. It's not like she's not talented or anything, but you know, she made it pretty big. And I was asking, you know, uh, one of my friends, I said, uh, how does this happen? You know? And he said, Oh, my dear boy, her, her father is the president of the local savings and trust bank. See these kind of things help. So if you are not coming from some sort of royalty, or if you're not having these particular connections in the world of commerce, like me, you know, I, my, my dad's a construction worker. I have nobody that he can tell. We really have to sell ourselves. And it's hard. It's, it's a hard thing to do. And that is whenever talent kind of rises to the surface. That is whenever you have to say, I have to make an impact over somebody that they know. You know, I have to prove myself this, because other people out there are doing the same thing that you're doing. And people know those names but you have to do something a little bit better or a little bit differently than those persons. So I'm very proud about how I was able to achieve where I'm at today. You know, I don't have a mansion. I don't drive a Bugatti. I have none of that kind of stuff, but at least I, you know, I, to say that you make over um, what um, you know, the, the, the common person, they, they say that the average author makes less than $500 a year. So if I make over 500 bucks a year, I, hey, I, I'm better than the average author, you know, or at least more successful than that. So, I mean, that's the kind of little goals I, that I set for myself, little baby steps and things that make me happy at the end of the day. And these are the things that keep me going. If nobody read my books, um, I, would not, I would stop writing. You know, I, it, it, as much as I would like to tell a story, um, at the end of the day, I would tell them to my kids whenever they're, I'm putting them to sleep at night instead of writing them down. So it really comes down to wanting to talk to people and wanting to have something to say and say, look, I have a story I have to tell you. Come on over here and listen. And really telling it to someone that you've never met before, to have someone that you've never met before listen to your words and open up a broader view on their life. That means, that means everything to me. That's, that's something we should all keep in mind. Uh, it's stories that uh, keep us going, but we need people sure. to read them. And like you said, if we get out there and show ourselves, get ourselves known, that's how people get to know us. They got to keep seeing it. it. That's you right. They have to keep yeah, you can't put out one book in the and say, "Hey," and everybody comes flocking to it. There's just That's too right. much out there. That's so, right. That's right. So your books are on Amazon. Where else can we see your books? And are you doing any appearances this year? Um. Well, I'm scheduled to have appearances. I'm scheduled to be um, in Littleton um, on the uh, uh, next to the last weekend of um, of October. I'm scheduled to be there. I'm also scheduled to be in Chicago in October, and um, but but the thing is, so we don't know, you know. That's right. And, and I would hate to tell somebody to put this out there, and um, they uh, they make they book and they they can't be there, you know. So the best thing to do is if you go to my social media, uh, Facebook, um, where you can go to Ronald L. Murphy Jr. And you can like my author page or you can just friend me as Ronald Murphy, you know, on there as well, too. I'll keep you updated about where I'm going to be. And I will not make any kind of post until I know that the event is definitely on. Right. But, yeah, you can go to Amazon.com and find my stuff. Ooh, Ronald L. Murphy, J-R at Yahoo.com. That's my personal email address. Give me, give me a buzz. You don't have to buy anything off me. We can talk about something if you want to. I have no problem with that. But, uh, yeah, I like to I, – I naturally like to talk to people. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those – quintessential people up the way and pick my brain or, or even better, I can pick your brain as well too. <laughs> like even touch with me. That sounds good. And that's very generous. Uh, when are you going to be in Chicago in October? Uh, um, I, let me see here. Let me go to my little thing, Majiggy. 
Uh, let me see. I will tell you. I will be in Urbania. Urba Urbania? Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, let me just get the calendar out here. Um, I will be there uh, October 10th and the 11th uh, at the, uh, the Horror and Crime um, uh, uh, conference out there, which oh. is going to be kind of cool. Well, that does it, sound cool. I'm I'll be a little bit on the 17th. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we yeah, were so that's, what, that's what's on the agenda for me. We, we were supposed to go to New Orleans for a writer's get-together conference over Halloween, but now that that's not happening, there's a convention thing I go to in Chicago usually, so we might go to that instead. I was just yep. thinking that'd be cool to meet up, but different times. Oh, yeah, no, I, I think it would be cool. And, and interesting that you should say that, too. I was scheduled to be in New Orleans as well, too, but I did not post anything because um, the last time I talked to the organizer, there was a lot of cancellations going on. And the idea of social distancing sometimes makes conferences, um, you know, really, there's no purpose. If yeah. You can't be there talking to people. <laughs> right. So, so many things are canceled. It'll be in, uh, in New Orleans this year as well, too. Yeah. The biggest blow was I was supposed to be in London. I was supposed to be in London in April. Really? Oh. And that happened. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Well, you know, yeah. maybe things will pick up and they'll look for – all new things, you know, maybe you can get a show back again. I'm, I'm hoping so. Well, the thing is, I think um, a lot of us might be able to have some sort of uh, influx into the industry at this point because so many things are on hold. Nothing's being yeah. produced right now. And whenever the gates open up, you know, they're going to need a lot of creativity out there. So, Yeah, actually, Colin was in talks uh, for a bit with the producers of the Jeff Gold <laughs> Goldblum show on Disney. And uh, that's on hold, so who knows yes. if that'll even come back. Very, very cool, very cool. Yeah. Uh, a lot of good people out there. It's just really having to get our name out there, who we are, where we're at, and what we have to give. Um, but, um, yeah, so I think whenever Hollywood opens up, there's going to be such a need for ideas because no movies are being made. There's nothing right. being made for television or anything. There's going to be – and for authors, that's one of the first places people come looking is these stories that are already pre-written. Right. Yep. So here's hoping all of us will benefit from that. Keep our fingers crossed. That's right. That's right, my friend. All right, Ron. Well, I appreciate the time and, you know, little hiccups aside. I think, uh, <clears throat> oh, yeah. Very well. I thank you. I appreciate it, my friend. Hey, I, I, again, I was flattered to be on here. Um, I think that this is essential for anybody that's, that's in the industry or wants to get into the industry. Um, but, yeah, I hope we can network out there. Like I said, anybody wants to get in hold of me. Ronald L. Murphy Jr. at yahoo.com. Perfect. Great, you. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> no worries, buddy. No worries. Thank you so much. Tell everybody we said hi. I will do that. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Discovered Wordsmiths. Come back next week and listen to another author discuss the road they've traveled and maybe sometime in the near future, it might be you.